Welcome. My name is Pam Hart, and I am director of the Animal Law Program at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Well, thank you. We're going to start the night with our award ceremony. And this is going to recognize legal professionals and law students who have made extraordinary strides to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. We'd like to begin by honoring attorneys and law firms who have dedicated their time, commitment, and legal expertise to advancing the field of animal law. The Animal Legal Defense Fund would never be able to do what we do without the support of legal professionals. So ALDF would like to show you our gratitude tonight, the attorneys who help us win the case against cruelty every day by awarding them with the Advancement in Animal Law Pro Bono Achievement Award. So if you could please come up here when I call your name and your firm name and meet Tom Linney, who is ALDF's pro bono coordinator, I'd appreciate it. Jeremy Esterkin of Bingham and McCutcheon, could you please come up? Larissa Newman of Fenwick and West. Colin Murray and Andrew Walsh of Irel Manella. If you could please come up and receive your award. Thank you. Alicia Shaw of Kirkland and Ellis. Paul Bird and Courtney Verdrell of McKenna, Long, and Aldridge. Nicole Roth, Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. Yeah, Nicole. Virginia Coleman of Ropes and Gray. And last but not least, Morgan Hector of Steptoe and Johnson. On behalf of ALDF and the animals, thank you for all you do. It's such an honor to work with you, and we cannot express our gratitude for everything you do for us to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. Now we'd like to recognize and honor the recipient of the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund Chapter of the Year Award. This award celebrates a chapter that has shown excellence in its efforts to advance the field of animal law. This chapter was founded in February of this year. It was our 189th student chapter. They had 25 members attend their first meeting. The following month, they had that number rise to 40 members, and it is now the largest student association at their university. Two months after forming, this chapter participated in our national CELDA fundraiser in honor of Turk, who was a 14-year-old helmeted guinea fowl who was brutally killed at a wildlife habitat. Not only did this chapter support this important work, they managed to raise more funds than any other participating chapter. And finally, this chapter has petitioned their law school to add an animal law course to the curriculum. And this course is being taught by our very own Joyce Tischler, founder of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. So for these reasons and many more, we are extremely proud to have John F. Kennedy, University College of Law, be our first ever recipient of the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund Chapter of the Year Award. So if the, we can have the President Matthew Taxman, as well as the Vice President Danny Sanchez come up to receive the award, we'd appreciate it. Good job, thank you. Oh, look at this. Oh, and they knew about our theme here, winning the case against cruelty. Thank you very much.
Next, we would like to move on to our Leadership Award, and it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite people on the planet, Joyce Tischler, who, as I said, is the founder of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and she is currently our general counsel, and I will turn it over to you. Joyce Tischler. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, and oops, and congratulations to all who have won those awards. This year, we have established the Animal Law Leadership Award to recognize members of our community for their contributions to the field of animal law through education and advocacy. And tonight, we're going to award the very first recipient. And he has no idea he's receiving this award. Are we not evil? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Liberty. It is my pleasure to present this award to Professor David Favor. <laughs> give, me, give me a minute, and then I'll get you up here. First, I want to tell them about you. Oh. <laughs> Only the stuff that can be told on prime time. Uh, for over 30 years, David Favor has been in the forefront of animal law as a teacher, an activist, an advocate, and a scholar. He's written numerous articles and books on animal law issues, particularly animal rights, animal cruelty, wildlife law, the use of animals for scientific research, and the international control um, of animal trade. He is truly one of the visionaries of this field. He's responsible for developing a number of novel legal theories, including, and I hope you've read all of his articles, equitable self-ownership for animals, a new tort for animals. He was the first lawyer to regularly attend CITES, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. He wrote the only book on CITES resolution, and he paved the way for the involvement of lawyers in CITES, which was sorely needed. Um, today, he's one of, oh, I'm sorry, back in 2004, he organized the very first International Animal Law Conference, which introduced us to other lawyers and law students from other parts of the world and really changed the landscape of animal law. Today, he's one of the principal organizers of the second global animal law conference that will be held in Barcelona next July. In 1983, when I was still in grade school, <laughs> da David co-wrote the very first book on animal law. And while it wasn't a case book, it provided a very young animal law movement with a way to discuss these important issues. Many attorneys had their first exposure to animal law through David's book. He was one of the first lawyers to start a national conversation about animal rights. And I remember back then when David and Steve Wise started talking about rights while the rest of us were just, just working on the welfare issue. David and Steve co-wrote the very first law review article arguing for rights for chimpanzees. It was so far ahead of its time It was so far ahead of its time that nobody would publish it. <laughs> and if you want a copy, give me a call. <laughs> David served on the board of ALDF for 22 years. He was on our very first board of directors. And on a personal level, when we were surviving from month to month, I would sit on the phone with David, and he was standing by us. He was sweating it out with us. He was the only person we trusted for many years to be our treasurer, and eventually we let him be the chair of the board, which he seemed to like a lot. For He's presently the legislative chair of the American Bar Association TIPS Committee on Animal Law. 
He continues to write and to lecture and to inspire. Um, background on David, he's been a professor of law for a lot of years at Michigan State University College of Law. He's the founder, the editor-in-chief, and the force behind the Animal Legal and Historical Web Center, which is really a key resource for people all around the world. Yeah, absolutely. He lives on a beautiful farm in Lansing, Michigan, with his wife, Marty. The kids are now gone, but they share the place with sheep and chickens and llamas and some dogs and cats. The field of animal law would not be what it is today without the contributions of David Favor. So please help me in saying hello to my colleague and my dear friend, David Favor. expect a speech from a guy who didn't have a clue. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce a, a woman who defies introduction, the other Pam. If you have never been Pam Pammed, uh, you're in for a treat. The first and only Assistant Dean of Animal Law and the Executive Director of the Center for Animal Law Studies, Pamela Frosch. Thank you, Joyce. It's always nice to be introduced by the mother of animal law, so that feels good. And David, we got gotcha. you. That was great. <laughs> it was hard to keep that secret. But now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker for the evening. Jane Velas Mitchell is an award-winning television journalist, a best-selling author, and the host of her own show on HLN called Jane Velas Mitchell. And it airs weeknights at 7 p.m. Eastern, and if you're not watching it, you need to watch this show. <laughs> she is frequently in the media as an expert commentator on high-profile court cases, appearing on, among others, CNN, Insider, True TV, e, Dr. Phil, and a whole bunch of other national television programs. She has also served as a guest host for Nancy Grace on her HLN show, and has covered the biggest trials of the last two decades, everything from the O.J. Simpson trial to the George Zim Zimmerman trial. But most relevantly, okay, yeah, and that one, <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't forget. But most relevantly for us at this conference is how she has provided unflinching analysis and critique of the many ways in which animals are abused in our society. Over the years, she has brought worldwide attention to a range of cruelties, everything from wild horse roundups to dolphin slaughter, from the use of great apes in invasive research to government-sponsored wolf-killing programs to gestation crates in the pork industry. She's seen it all, she's reported on all of it, and we are all better informed because of it. Just this week, she provided special coverage on the documentary Beyond Blackfish, which explores what really happens to whales in captivities, especially at so-called entertainment facilities like SeaWorld. For her work, she has received three Genesis Awards from the Humane Society of the United States, as well as Emmy Awards and the Ruby Award, and I'm sure a whole bunch of other awards that I don't even know about. But we are so thrilled that she was able to take time out of her very, very busy schedule to join us here tonight. So please, without further ado, please welcome Jane Bellas Mitchell. <laughs> Jane. Oh. oh, don't, don't, go ahead. Go ahead. I was uh, attending some of the conferences, and, and frankly, everything that I was going to say was covered so beautifully by all of these incredible speakers, brilliant speakers, who I want to have on my show. I thought they were kind of auditioning. <laughs> but it's OK, because I'll, I'll speak less, because I know Moby's performing, right, after? I was told, I was told that Moby was performing tonight. 
You're, you're kidding me. He's, he's not coming? Well, I might have to perform then. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. That's an animal rights song there. It's an old tune, right? My parents used to sing it. Actually, my dad would sing uh, Blue Moon, and my mother would sing that song, and they'd sing it at the same time. They thought they were so clever, they just drove me mad. Um, but um, I'll talk about my mom for a second, because um, she's the reason I'm an animal rights activist. Uh, my mom uh, was born in Puerto Rico in 1916, and um, she's always been on the forefront. She was one of the first hyphenated. She's also Velez Mitchell. But when she was about four, she had a pet pig. She thought it was her pet pig. She came home from school one day, and her pet pig was on the dining room table on a spit, and she fainted. And she woke up, and she never ate meat again. And so that was at about 1920. So when she came to New York, and then she became a very successful, she was the last of the vaudevilles. I think I'm dating myself now. But my mom's 97, and you know what? She's uh, essentially a vegan. My sister comes into town every so often and feeds her cheese, but she's a vegan, pretty much. And she said, you know, I had the last laugh. I went to every one of their funerals. Because... <laughs> When I was a kid, they used to have these cocktail parties, and, and they would ridicule my mother. And um, my dad was Irish. He was a big meat eater. When he met her, he became also, I was raised by pescatarian parents. Isn't that, that has a good ring to it, doesn't it? Um, but um, uh, they would serve all this kooky stuff like brown rice and kelp at their cocktail parties, and people would snicker and make fun of them. Oh, that Anita. What's she thinking of? But she did. She, she went to every one of their funerals, and she is sharp as a tack at 97. She was out reciting poetry last night. Um, and uh, I think they're making a connection now between Alzheimer's and the overconsumption of meat and dairy products. We know that Alzheimer's is skyrocketing. And uh, when you think about it, I've read a little bit about this. I'm not a, a doctor. Uh, by the way, I'm not a lawyer either. I don't know if that's a problem with any of you. <laughs> What happened was that they, somebody sent me a gavel at one point, and I just started using it on the air. And then everybody assumed that I was some sort of retired judge. And people ask me legal questions all the time. And I'm like, I have no idea. Ask somebody else. And occasionally, I'll just sort of you know, go with some of the phraseology. Well, if she's speaking from the dead, isn't that an exception to the hearsay rule? And, and then the other people, the real lawyers on the panel will be kind of like, what the hell is she talking about? But, um, you know, uh, it's so great for me to be here because I do get depressed, um, mostly covering murder stories, but also covering uh, the horrible things that are happening, you know, the horrific things that are happening to animals. And when I come here and I see all these incredibly intelligent, articulate, motivated people with law degrees, I feel like, yes, I don't think there's a more important place to be on this planet right now than right here. The work that all of you are doing and will continue to do is going to be our salvation as a human species. We need this. So if I leave you with one thing, it's think outside the box. Uh, just talking to people around here, we've come up with about a dozen lawsuits. Just in the last over, I came up with two, right? We, we, together, we have two that we're going to do. One about the lack of uh, vegan options on uh, first class flights. OK? No, I actually flew coach here. Sorry to tell you that. And the guy with his hand the whole time into my ribs while I was trying to write the speech. Um, no, but it's true. I get very upset. They kill an animal on my behalf. I sit there whenever I get upgraded, which is rarely. But, you know, if I, if I am flying business or first, I'm very conscious of the fact that they've killed an animal for me. And I don't want them to do that. And that causes me pain and suffering. And so I think it's a very valid class action lawsuit. Let's get going. Let's do it. 
And um, also the idea that, you know, we were talking about uh, the horrible use of, we know that torturing monkeys in laboratories is not going to make anything better for people. And yet constantly this, you know, funding for this mindless funding with these grants that come up, um, let's face it, it, you know, just as they were talking about the conference, we're not using horses for transportation anymore, except if you live on Central Park South, unfortunately, which we're also working on. Uh, but uh, we don't, we, we're working on the molecular and the submolecular level with these kinds of experiments. We don't need to be sticking electrodes, uh, electrodes into monkeys' brains anymore, you know? And don't do it on behalf of the brave men and women who have served our country and who have gone to war and gotten traumatic brain injuries, they don't need that on top of everything else. What they need is good service from the Veterans Administration. <laughs> uh, by the way, before I go any further, I, I wanna say that none of us would be here if it weren't for some very generous generous people, and it really is so important to fund things like this. This is a world-changing event, and I want to thank the people who made this happen. So I know there's two anonymous donors. They don't want to have their names mentioned, so I'd like them to stand up if they could. <laughs> no, okay. Well, we will say uh, our Go Level sponsor is the Animal Welfare Financial Development. You know who you are. Now we're all going to be looking around. Who are they? Are they at our table? But thank you for your generosity. From the bottom of my heart, um, thank you. And I'd also like to thank our Silver Level sponsor, Z Rick and Elaine Rosen Laminac. Where are you? Woo! <laughs> Bless you. Bless you for what you're doing. And I would like to thank our bronze sponsor, Wendy Benjamin Morgan, who's at our table. Thank you. Bless you. This is so important, and it really will not happen without the generosity of these individuals. So let's give them a hand. Yeah. And please do it again next year, okay? <laughs> um, I am not a lawyer, as I mentioned, so how can I help you guys? Uh, what can I tell you that's gonna make you more effective out there? And uh, what I could say is, looking at it from the media perspective, it's very similar to when I watch opening and closing statements by attorneys, and I'm like, wow, you know so much about this case, nobody else does. Because what you're saying in your opening and closing statement is so arcane and so uh, minutia filled that we're not getting the big picture. You know, and so I think a lot of times we put so much effort into the nitty gritty of the lawsuits and da -da 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 -da, but what you need is a grabby headline. You need a sexy plaintiff or a, a sympathetic plaintiff. You need um, some publicity that you've filed the lawsuit. You need to hold the news conference on the courthouse steps. You need to get a celebrity involved. And these are some of the things that don't get followed through, and all the hard work that everybody puts in, it's like do those other things that are sort of counterintuitive because you know, we are very ethical people, so we want to play by the rules at all times. And so sometimes we just want to do everything very perfectly, and almost there's almost a sense of, well, that's, that's a little bit dirty. That's a little nasty. No, you've got to sell it. You've got to sell your story. These animals cannot speak for themselves. If you don't sell it, it ain't gonna get heard. So if I could say one thing, uh, I don't, as I've just already made clear, I, I don't know the nuances of the law, but I do know when I pick up a lawsuit and it's a good juicy lawsuit, I know this is a good lawsuit. Or this is one that I, I, I need a, a diet Red Bull to get through. Not that I really drink, yes I do. It's a, one of my last horrible habits. But, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about that and um, I wanna talk about some of the experiences that I've had in terms of um, working with organizations and with lawyers to achieve change. So I've been a, a journalist for 35 years now, which you could all say, oh no. Not 35 years. Um, so I'm very disappointed there was no shock in the audience whatsoever. Um, 
but um, I've been able to do hundreds and hundreds of stories, thank God, uh, as a result of just being you know, a TV journalist and being an activist at the same time. And um, uh, some of the stories just hit that magic component where everything came together. And it's just a couple of them that I'd like to mention. And one of them was this story we did about this group, Bioculture, this company. And, and I'll just tell you the story because it's it just sort of the way it unfolded. Because I think a lot of times everybody thinks that there's some kind of, you know, these smart people here that are deciding TV or news. And, and it, it really isn't like that. And I think everybody's just sort of, yeah, I'm not saying I don't work with very smart people, please. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there's no big committee. It just kind of news happens, you know, and you've got to go with it. You've got to roll with it and you can't really control it. I was in uh, Puerto Rico at the National Association of Hispanic Journalists on June 25th, 2009. And um, all of a sudden, all the cell phones started to go off. And I, we all kind of realized it's a big story. And then I got the call and they said, Jane, and they were really kind of scared to tell me this because they knew how upset I'd be. They said, uh, we think Michael Jackson has died. And I was like, oh my God, because I have covered Michael Jackson for decades. I mean, I was the Michael Jackson person. I covered the Michael Jackson child molestation trial. I was there every day. I reported on it for Nancy Grace. And I was in the courtroom with him on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, it was a tragedy that he died. Uh, he's an incredible performer, but it was also like my story. And I was out of pocket. I was on an island and I couldn't do my show. And to this day, it was the highest rating we ever got on our show and I wasn't there. <laughs> so I was in my hotel room and I was like, oh, and my, my friends and relatives, what, why are you in Puerto Rico? Michael Jackson's dead. And I'm like, I'm not a psychic. I didn't know this was gonna happen. You know, just making me crazier and crazier. So I literally prayed. I, I prayed and I said, God, why am I here? Why am I here on this most important day of, of a news story? And you know, a friend of mine uh, had said, I have this friend, Glenn, who's a great activist, and he doesn't belong to any group, he just does activism, which you can all do, and I'm, you all do. And uh, he had told me about this company in Puerto Rico called Bioculture that was a company that takes monkeys from the wild, and they take thousands of them, and then they they breed monkeys for laboratory experimentation. And he told me that they were building a facility in Puerto Rico. And um, I had my camera with me. And so I said something in my head, I, I prayed about it. And I, what I heard was I was supposed to do something on this story, that that's why I was there. So I called Glenn and he said, um, you know, here's what we know. And then, uh, you know, there's these, these young, these girls, they're young women from the Puerto Rican Bar Association Animal Rights Subcommittee and they're gonna come over to the hotel. Maybe you could talk to them about that. So I talked to them and they said, I did an interview with them and they said, we had no idea this was happening. Nobody knows that this is happening. This is happening under the radar. So I had a story and I went back and um, PETA got involved. Meanwhile, these two young ladies, and they were just out of law school and they had formed this animal rights subcommittee, they took it upon themselves. This is what I talk about, thinking outside the box and pushing the envelope and being I don't want to say any kind of slang word, but being gutsy, being like, do something that kind of scares you a little bit that don't break the law, use the law. And um, they held a news conference at the Puerto Rican Bar Association. And they got all these videos from PETA about uh, laboratory experimentation on monkeys. And they invited all the media and all the media showed up, believe it or not. Everybody showed up and they were horrified by what they saw. And the thing that they were the most horrified about is that nobody in the media even knew that this was being built. So then I did the story and at one point, like I said, it touched me personally because my mom was born in Vieques, an island off Puerto Rico. That was where they used to do the military bombing and they stopped it. And she even testified at the United Nations about that. And um, I said, you know, this is what I said on my show is, has the island of enchantment, is the island of enchantment going to become hell on earth for monkeys? So that was a good headline. And that's another thing we need to do is to have good headlines for our lawsuits. And so I did one story on it and then PETA got involved. They filed 
a lawsuit. They got lawyers. They flew lawyers down there, and they started getting a coalition of animal groups because it turned out that they were going to bring 4,000 monkeys that they were stealing from Mauritius, I think is how you pronounce it. Is that how you pronounce it? And they were taking them from the wild. Then they were going to take it to take them to Puerto Rico, where they were already building this facility in this town called Guayama, and they were going to breed them for laboratory experimentation. So this was going to be a massive massive breeding operation. Well, the first thing that occurred to me was, well, they're probably doing it there because they think they can get away with it there, and they think that people are just not going to pick up on it because, well, they're going to just, you know, we'll do this over here. No, they're not going to They're not gonna know, right? So it's kind of this arrogance of we're going to be able to do this. So it turned out that uh, there was a state senator who was in an environmental committee and found out that there were environmental. She launched an investigation. The, anim the environmental subcommittee of the Senate, one of the subcommittees, launched an investigation. And they found out that the permitting process was not being adhered to. And the environmental impact studies hadn't been adhered to. And the thing was already complete, almost completed. So I did, several, I did several stories. Now, this went on for about a year. And then, in New York, the Puerto Rican Day Parade came up. And I said to myself in the morning, I said, I'm going to go to, was just so weird, my mom said something about there was a breakfast f at the Marriott for dignitaries, and I didn't even know this. And I said, let's go, Mom, you and me, let's go down there, and I'm going to take my camera. So it turned out that there was, uh, Puerto Rico doesn't have an actual representative. They have like a, a representative commissioner that represents in the, because uh, it's a commonwealth, represents in the um, House of Representatives. He was there. His name is Pierre Luisi. And the mayor of the town where they were building this was there. And her name was Gloria Marie. And they told me, look for her. She's like a blonde bombshell. And she used to be some kind of either soap star or she's very, she's very pretty. You'll be able to recognize her right away. So sure enough, there she is. And I pulled out my camera and I'm like, do you love animals? And she's like, oh, of course I love animals. Animals, I love animals. I said, well, what about monkeys? She's like, monkeys? I said, well, they're building this facility in your town. She's like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the bottom line is she really hadn't thought about it. And also, they had said something about, oh, this is going to bring jobs, right? Well, there's a lot of jobs. Cleaning up monkey excrement? I mean, what kind of jobs is that, right? So uh, the next thing you know, all hell broke loose. There were protests. There were a lot of protests in Puerto Rico. It turns out that there is a sizable animal rights movement there. And so you have a great convergence of, you had the media, you had the Bar Association, you had the State Senate, you had PETA with their lawyers, you had these, turns out Glory Marie thought about it and she decided, I don't want this here after hearing all sides. And she came out and issued a statement against it. So guess what happened? It went all the way through the courts, the lawsuits, and ultimately, in 2012, after a lengthy legal battle, the Puerto Rican Supreme Court said it was illegally built, and you will not be able to occupy this. <laughs> Thousands of monkeys were saved from a horrific, horrific, horrific life and death as a result of that. And you know, if you strike me down dead right now, I, that was one of my most rewarding moments. Uh, and I didn't do it alone. I mean, I'm, I'm relating the story. A lot of hard work was done by a lot of people. But I say that to you young lawyers because I think there might be a sense that, well, oh, well, I have an idea for a lawsuit, but let me see if maybe... Maybe this group will do it. You know, you just do it. If you think that it's something that needs to be done, do it. Go out there. As somebody said, uh, when I remember there was a <laughs> there was a woman who was it was Dana Perino, I think she was about to be press secretary for George Bush, and I, I heard this story. I don't know if it's true or not, but she was backstage, and I I heard this. So don't quote me because I know. Let's just make it somebody. But, but I love this. If it is her, it's a big compliment. But, you know, it's nerve-wracking. Imagine going out and doing a White House news conference. I'd be terrified. And, and somebody said, just put on your big girl panties and get out there. <laughs> and that's what I say to all you lawyers. Just put on your big girl panties and get out there and file those lawsuits. <laughs> right? Are you going to do it?
is everybody going to go home tonight and write up a lawsuit? Um, and so, you know, I, I just think that that's so important because we are not going to affect change by being oh so very polite. And somebody else said, what is it, uh, a polite women rarely make history? I think Eleanor Roosevelt said that, so I see there's a lot of women in the audience. Yes, you'll be called obnoxious. It's okay, they call me obnoxious. I'm still standing here and I'm alive. It's not gonna kill me. And it's not gonna kill you either. You have to push the envelope. That's the way to do it. And if I leave you with one thing, it's don't be passive, be proactive. Whatever's going on out there that you find wrong, you have a moral obligation to try to stop it. And I love what Peter Singer, who we had on this week, who was obviously the professor of uh, bioethics at Princeton University and the author of Animal Liberation, said, and he wrote this other book, The Life You Can Save, I think it was called, and he said, you know, we have a moral obligation. If we were walking down the street and somebody is dying right there, we have a moral obligation to save that person. But he makes a brilliant point. Geography doesn't alter that moral obligation. And neither does species, I think. You know, if something wrong is happening, if it's happening in Iowa, if it's happening in Zimbabwe, wherever it's happening, we have a moral obligation to try to stop it. And that's what journalists do, and that's what lawyers do. So there's a lot of commonalities between journalists and lawyers. These are not jobs. These are vocations. And we, I know that none of you are in this for the money. You are in this to change what, whoa, whoa. Uh, I hope not. Um, but, you know, uh, my dad always used to say, do something you do for free, except somebody decided to pay you for it. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand there's some Q&A, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. But the idea is to um, work with the media. The media shouldn't be something that you consider separate and apart from what you do. It is part and parcel of what you do. And so... It's, it's, it's like you're maybe the, in the ER room in triage, but then it's gotta, the patient's got to go into the bed in the third floor of the hospital wing. It's the same thing. You've got to carry that story all the way through. It's like an arc. And if you leave those elements out, um, it's not going to have the impact. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, I thought so much was so brilliant that was said today in the various conferences I would like to see it up on YouTube, not as one giant conference, but as little clips. One of the things that we can really do now is really go straight to the people, thanks to internet technology, technology thanks to wireless. I mean, really, broadband really didn't hit critical mass until a couple of years ago. Everybody's trying to watch things on their TV and their, their little screens, and it wasn't quite working, and now it's like, boom. You're watching movies on your iPad. People are using their TV sets as a giant um, iPad, and they're going straight to Netflix, they're going to YouTube, they're going to Hulu, they're going to uh, Pandora. So you have the capacity with the technology that exists today, each of you to create your own network. There is a technology like Spreecast, which is basically a four box Skype, which you could use to have all sorts of conversations about the lawsuits you're gonna file, and then you can post that, and you can have it go all on Facebook, and you can use Instagram and Twitter, and YouTube, and Facebook, and Spreecast to spread the word, and so, it's, it's really about the fact that you don't need anybody to give you permission to say that's a story anymore. If you decide it's a story, it's a story, and then you just get it out there. Get it out there any way you can. Um, and, and that's part of it. You are kind of in the media, because if a tree falls and no one hears it, right? So, so you're a journalist, but the, I mean, you're, you're, a, uh, you're lawyers, but you're also, in a way, journalists. All right, thank you so much. I hope that was helpful. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? I, I don't know if anybody wants to ask questions or what we should do, but if you keep me up at this mic, I will sing. Hi, thank you. So um, 
maybe this is two part and I don't have to do, you don't have to answer both parts, but I'm wondering how exactly to get the media involved and get big names like you to be, you know, a, a, <laughs> like this, but, but also just to be broadcasting to everyone in the US, how do we get our stories out there? Well, like I think that's a really good question. And, you know, it's not easy. It's, it's, n there's no conspiracy of silence, as many people feel. I think it's really that journalism is a reflection of the culture. And I have to say, the culture is changing big time. Uh, when I started, did I mention 35 years ago? Um, no, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, but I was, when I tried to do animal rights stories, I was mocked, ridiculed, practically bullied. And look what has changed. Just this week, CNN did the premiere of Blackfish to a global audience. <laughs> Millions of people saw that. So things are changing. And I think you have to be imaginative, very imaginative. Um, I'll tell you that um, I learned that lesson as a kid. I was a young person who was very involved in politics and I had a table, I used to, basically it was an excuse to argue with people on a street corner um, and talk, which I enjoy doing. But uh, I would always, I, I was on the news like three or four times when I was a teenager. We held a mock funeral somewhere, and then we got covered for that. And uh, I was at a demonstration, I got covered. I was, I was getting, because I was a little bit kooky, maybe, a little bit out there. So, no, I'm not saying you have to throw you know, blood on yourself or do any of those things, but you do have to think outside the box and be creative and imaginative and have fun with it. I think that, you know, um, we're dealing in a world where, you know, for example, advertising, it's so sophisticated and they're appealing to people on subconscious level, um, connecting certain products to sex appeal, patriotism and status and class and all these other things. So, you know, it's okay to, to mix it up a little bit. And so I think if you're very imaginative, you can come up, here's what I always say. If somebody told you they were gonna put a bullet through your head and kill you if you didn't get on TV within a week with your story. Do you think you'd come up with something? Seriously, if you thought about it in those terms. Like, I have to come up with something that's gonna capture the imagination. Do you think you'd come up, would you start thinking differently? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think that, you know, uh, that, People love good visualizations of their story. And um, a story with a great headline, with a great um, hook, with some great visuals, uh, all of that works into it. And also how you present it. Like uh, you know, media, the 24 hour news cycle, it's very hard to spend a lot of time. There are, there, there are journalists certainly who do do spend uh, months and even years researching a story, but, but a vast majority of journalists have to turn things around very quickly. So if you organize it in a way that really tells a story, gives a headline, provides the supporting documentation, supp uh, provides whatever articles may have been written related to the subject, provides the video links with the consent forms, with the contact information, and you structure it in a way that one email tells the entire story with, with the visual aspects, and where you can, you know, how you can link to them. Nobody even has tape anymore. There's no handing anybody a tape. It doesn't even happen. Everything's on a link. So if you, you can organize things in, in one email that will present the story in a very, like, here it is. And I've, I've had those discussions with, with um, organizations where it's, you know, I get a, uh, like a one line, like, hey, you think you'd be interested in this? Da -da -da -da. And it's like, whoa, I, I don't even know what that is. And so I don't want to ever disappoint. But if it were presented in a way where it was who, what, when, where, why, how, here are the elements, here's the supporting documentation so that I know that whatever it is you're saying actually happened, here's, you know, it, it, I think part of it's just how you organize a story to pitch it and a good headline and tell what, the, what is the story in a nutshell. That's the key. And so there's that. And then there's also creative way to tell the story. Um, 
And uh, I think it's also trying various outlets. And again, I think you can create a platform for yourself. Uh, for example, anytime you've clicked on any cable network, you see lawyers talking, right? Most of you are lawyers, right? How many people are lawyers in this room? Okay, so become talking heads on cable. You guys are lawyers. People are looking for lawyers. And then you can maybe work into animal issues if that opportunity arises. A very good friend of mine, Lisa Bloom, she's a lawyer and an animal activist. Now she's all over the media all the time. She used to be on Court TV. She's with avo.com. She's very, very, um, she's ubiquitous. She's all over the place. And she also happens to be a vegan and an animal rights activist. And there are times when she'll weave that right into the conversation. So all of you should get media training and be able to present as just talking about anything, any kind of social issue. How many of you would want to go on television and talk about those issues, just other issues? Okay. Uh, uh, how about radio? Uh, okay, another question? Or did you have another part? You actually answered the second part, okay. so thank you. All right, cool. Oh, here's I, a lady. Do you have another question there? It's not really a question, um, more like a comment. <laughs> Are you going to sing? And an anecdote. <laughs> I do not sing. Sorry. Um, I thank you for the last question and the answer to that. Uh, that was really helpful because I've definitely held a press conference before where no media showed up, and it's quite okay. I have. I have. Want to? I want to say one thing. Always videotape your own press conference. So then you take that and you put that on the web. You put it on YouTube and you, you create a link and you send it out to every organization and you get it going on Facebook. Again, the media is changing at this point. You can create your own critical mass in that sense. We did. Okay. And that also had the effect of making the, the public passerbyers think that there was actual real press there. So that was... <laughs> 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 well done, well done. So you were talking about thinking outside the box and like how to make something a story and I just wanted to relate this story about one of my ongoing cases um, where I didn't have to think outside the box because the animal involved actually did it for me. I, um, I brought a lawsuit against the National Marine Fishery Service under the Endangered Species Act uh, for failing to list the poor beagle shark as an endangered species, and the day that we filed the complaint, a poor beagle shark actually bit a fisherman in Scotland, and at first I was mad at the shark, you know, like, what are you doing? We're trying to protect you, and you're just going out there biting people, like, no, no one's going to, like, be on your side, but that's what made the, the story. story, yeah, be a story, yeah. because complaints, you know, endangered well, you, species Well, you, you raise a very good point, always work on what the news cycle is. So tag it to something that's happening. And the news cycle changes so quickly that you really have to operate quickly. So I think, you know, tragically we have to prepare. What is our response to the next crisis in terms of a health crisis? And you know what I'm talking about, involving some something with animals probably. Um, the time isn't to sit around and say, oh, what do we do now? Um, so you have to have, you have to anticipate what's going to happen and prepare for it. And you don't have to have, um, all of the answers. You can ask questions. Now, if we don't know what the cause of some of these terrible outbreaks are, and we're not going to know definitively. So I, I remember, uh, an animal group saying to me, well, you can't really hold a news conference about that. Or, well, why can't you ask the question and say, we're wondering whether these outbreaks of these, um, for example, like a swine flu might be connected to the conditions in which these animals are kept. Can you investigate that? Isn't that something that American citizens have the right to ask our government? Do we have to wait till we have a definitive answer to have a news conference about that or to ask that question? No. Go ahead, sorry. No. <laughs> oh, that's all. That's that's the end of my story. Yeah. I was no. Just saying, like it was like because I mean I file like 
complaints all the time, and usually Endangered Species Act like cases don't, aren't newsworthy unless they're like really big deals, like the polar bear one. Um, and it was it was just a complete coincidence because I filed the complaint, and then later that day the shark bit the guy. And you got some press out of that. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay, so you did. You did. Good for you. You made it happen. <laughs> yeah. We have another question over here. Okay. So my question is, do you find in the media that it is easier for you to get coverage of more iconic animals? So, you know, Blackfish obviously was crazy on Twitter and it got so much response from people who've been to SeaWorld. But <coughs> would that have been the same if it was a coyote? Do you find that it's easier with some animals? Well, I think that the culture is changing, and I do feel that people are expanding their circle of compassion beyond dogs and cats. Uh, now, I don't want to be Pollyanna because obviously the vast majority of stories involving animals are cute little feature stories. And actually, when I was promoting my book, uh, Expose the Secret Life of Jody Arias, which hit, hit number five on the New York Times bestseller list, by the way. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, I had to get that in there because nobody looks at the list anymore. It's like, what's the point of hitting number five if nobody's seeing it? Um, and anyway, um, I was doing hits around the country to promote, so I was hearing local newscasts, and you know, I, I was hearing things like, we're gonna have a bull run, and, peop and there's reporters reporting it absolutely uncritically, not asking, well, you know, how do they, are these, ter are these animals running because they're terrified? Where do these animals come from? Where are they going? Are they being exploited? None of that. And then just, just a cheerful sort of advertisement for the bull run, and it's coming to 12 counties. And it was just so horrifying to me. And so uh, I was thinking, where is the proactive? This didn't come out of nowhere. They didn't all of a sudden spontaneously decide to do this in 12 cities. There was probably months of planning. They had to probably go through the city council. Like, where were people checking up on what the city councils and these county commissions are doing. That's where a lot of this stuff happens. And so somebody should have caught that somewhere along the line and taken an action on behalf of animals long before that because the reporter isn't necessarily going to do all that math in their head themselves, but if there was uh, a protest expressing the animal side of the story, they'd cover it because people, uh, journalists love conflict. but. That is, it's incumbent upon people. Now, you know, we live in this age of social media and what, whatever subject you're, or whatever cause you're involved in, there's a lot of discussion about how people don't take to the streets anymore and they just do Facebook. And that's, that's good. You can do change.org. You can do a lot of things. But there is something to the old-fashioned get out there and, and protest if you feel that something is happening that's unfair towards animals. And certainly that's a visual that is going to interest the media. And that happens a lot. Like for example, the New York carriage horse issue. There's a lot of protests against carriage horses in New York and I've covered them and they're the people come out and they protest and they get coverage every time. They get all the news, all the papers, the New York Daily News, the Post and the local news story shows and th because there's something to, to videotape. So that's part of it, you, you, you know, you have to look at it from the perspective of, if you were a journalist, how would you know that there's a problem? That makes sense. Thank you. Question here. <laughs> just, just gonna fix that, because I'm very small. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, a lot of the points you've made are really, really very important. And I think, but a lot of, I think what, a lot of what we care about is um, challenging the status quo Mm -hmm. which I think is really difficult in this country, especially things like uh, factory farming and um, things where people don't often think about the animals involved and it's kind of an institutionalized cruelty. So I wondered when, when animal lawyers try to take a creative approach to combat what most people in this country consider normal, how do we avoid media backlash and how do we avoid being seen as like those crazy animal lawyers who are being so kooky and, and kind of getting dismissed in that way? Well, I don't think you should characterize yourself that way because the idea that you're even thinking of that as a possibility, I think kind of, in other words, I found in, in general in life, when you take yourself seriously, people take you seriously. And so uh, what we're doing is extremely important work 
there's a lot of problems with uh, factory farming. I've covered it numerous times in my show. Clearly, we've talked about the connection between the obesity crisis in America and the, um, the subsidies to big agra. And um, these are really serious political issues that are being discussed right now. Um, and by the way, if you do anything, please, please take action on the King Amendment because the, it's going into conference committee <laughs> this week. And so, you know, I've talked about it on my show. This is the crucial week. And we really, that is going to, as, as somebody said at the conference, I think you said it, it's, it's going to be devastating. Uh, I, I worked on Prop 2 in California. I was actually freelance when Prop 2 happened, and I threw, I don't know, about four parties, and um, I collected signatures at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market. I devoted, like, a, you know, a year of my life to that, and I was, again, it was one of the peak experiences when Prop 2 passed. And this is going to just eviscerate that, and the frog and the shark fin ban, and all of this stuff. You know, uh, we have to really um, don't, you know, please contact whoever you've got to contact. I mean, that is priority number one Monday morning. Okay? Promise? Yeah, um, yeah you got to. Um, what were you saying again? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think we're kooky. We're, things are changing. That's, that's all yesteryear. That's yesteryear. Let me give you one example. And then I, 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 I don't want to, you know, I could tell it's like we're flagging. Everybody's like, more coffee, please. Um, no, but uh, about a dozen years ago, I was working in L.A. at Celebrity Justice, which was uh, Harvey Levin's show before he started TMZ. And um, I covered this actress. I think she may have had a role on Little House on the Prairie at one point. And she was protesting bullhooks. They threw her in jail, first of all. And she called me from jail, and she said, I, I'm trying to order vegan food, and I don't know if they're purposely trying to starve me or they're just stupid, because they will not feed me this vegan food. <laughs> she was considered a flake, such a flake, right? Well, guess what? Things have changed a lot, and I, I didn't get to this, but I, I'm holding in my hands a lawsuit from my buddy David Castleman is a prominent Los Angeles lawyer. And talk about you don't need to be part of an organization to file a lawsuit. He filed a lawsuit on behalf of a couple of guys, one Aaron Leiter and another guy, uh, saying that um, the L.A. Zoo is cruel to elephants, okay? And they've been fighting about this in court since 2007. And... Uh, he got a victory. He got a victory. He didn't get a whole victory. They haven't moved Billy the Elephant out yet. But this is exactly what the judge said. The court will enter an injunction prohibiting the defendants from using bull hooks and electric shock in the management care and discipline of the elephants at the Los Angeles Zoo. The court will also issue an injunction requiring defendants, i.e., the city of LA and the director of the zoo to exercise the elephants at the Los Angeles Zoo at least two hours a day unless weather or emergency conditions make such exercise impracticable. And it goes on and on and on. And basically the judge agreed with the uh, plaintiffs. It is, um, I, I wanna get that because it, it's really beautiful that this is a judge issuing a statement on behalf of um, the plaintiffs. This is his ruling. And basically, essentially, if I get it here, I, I circled so many things, but he, he agreed. He agreed with the premise that these animals were suffering. He didn't say this was a kooky lawsuit. He didn't say this was idiotic. Um, and what they wanted was an order closing the elephant exhibit at the Los Angeles Zoo. They didn't quite get that, but they're still appealing. But essentially, he agreed with them, and he said that the, the zoo is not a happy place, and these animals are miserable. And that's pretty much a direct, a direct quote from the judge. He didn't, you could tell I'm not a lawyer. It's somewhere in here. Um, it's somewhere in here. Now I'm, now I'm gonna keep you all sitting there while I find it. Um, conclusion, I found it. 
This is the judge speaking. The elephants of Asia exhibit at the Los Angeles Zoo is not a happy place for elephants, nor is it for members of the public who go to the zoo and recognize that the elephants are neither thriving, happy, nor content. Captivity is a terrible existence for any intelligent, self-aware species, which the undisputed evidence shows elephants are. To believe otherwise, as some high-ranking zoo employees appear to believe, is delusional. <laughs> and the quality of life that Billy, Tina, and Jewel endure in their captivity is particularly poor. This is the judge speaking. <laughs> so no, we're not kooky. We're doing what has to be done. So I don't know when you want to wrap up uh, or, you know, I'm at your disposal. One more question? Uh, sure. One more question. Okay. Um, hi there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, first, who was that judge? I would love to write him a letter thanking him for that. Uh, or her. Let's see. The Honorable John L. Siegel. Siegel. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, sorry. I'm going to adjust this. I'm not a lawyer yet, but you spoke about um, building rapport with journalists to kind of have a collaboration effort to use um, journalism in our favor, almost. So You're not using, journalists' well, responsibility is to cover these stories. We're not doing anybody favors. Well, this is media. our job. Yeah. Um, would you, do you have any recommendations though, especially for young lawyers, how to first collaborate and make those connections to um, build a rapport with the journalists in the area so it's more of a streamline where if you have a case that you're working on, you, you have a contact or something along those lines or do you recommend just doing it on your own and, or I don't know, just well, do you have I, recommendations I, I of how to go about it? understand. It seems very mysterious and it's really, you know, people always say to me, you know, do you, when you have lunch, I haven't had lunch in 35 years, okay? <laughs> it's like, we're running around, uh, you know, practically <laughs> just tripping over ourselves. This woman's mad at me because I didn't call her back. <laughs> and, she, and I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but we have a plan. We're going to do something. We're going to do the Skype thing. Yeah, so, um, but... No, I don't think it's like it is in the movies where people get together and they have these long lunches, you know, and there's always this idea that, you know, journalists are sitting at the bar talking to their sources. I mean, I guess it happens. I, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've been sober 18 and a half years, so I'm not, I'm not hanging out at the bar. But, um, no, I think it's, you know, I always say don't beg. Like... If, if a story's good, people will come to you. And the idea is to make it so good that people will sort of fall over themselves to come to you. Um, a lot of organizations have done a great job with that. I would say, just off the top of my head, this is not, and I, you know, I work with Humane Society, with, with this organization, with Last Chance for Animals, with PETA, with um, Mercy for Animals, but look at Mercy for Animals. I mean, they have gotten amazing coverage. And they're not running around begging anybody. They're doing incredible undercover investigations that are making headlines. And you cannot ignore that story. And they're getting amazing, amazing coverage on major networks. And so they've made it a must cover. Thank you. I like that response. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. Jane thank Bella you. Mitchell. Thank you.